They also found blood on the Shroud of Turin. According to medical physicist Dr. John Heller and blood specialist Dr. Alan Adler, they found not only the markings on the shroud were blood, but blood highly loaded with bilirubin, a bile pigment that would only show up if a dead man had been severely or traumatically beaten. And pathologist Pierre Ballone came to the further conclusion that the blood spots were human blood and of the type AB. In fact, there are 13 tests that confirm that blood was on the shroud. The image on the shroud is negative, but the blood marks are positive. The blood marks on the shroud have remained red, and why it hasn't darkened by time and oxidation is unexplainable. Uh, at the back of the toes on the shroud, there's an original bleeding when the man was alive, and then in the tomb, there was a renewed bleeding. So two blood flows, and, and this is impossible for someone to forge. In fact, the experts were shocked by the way the blood evidence was transferred to the shroud. It was done perfectly without one smear, which practically, humanly speaking, is impossible. Dr. Max Fry was a Swiss criminologist. He was one of the leading experts in dust and pollen analysis in the whole world. In fact, he single-handedly developed a technique to determine where criminals had been by testing samples of dust and pollen from their clothing and he was consulted on many crimes by police forces of many nations. Dr. Fry's objective was very simple. If the shroud was forged in France in the 14th century, then only the French or Italian pollens will be found in the cloth. But his exhaustive analysis found some 58 specific pollens, only 17 were native to Europe. The rest were from Palestine and southern Turkey, the site of Edessa and Constantinople. And this meant that the shroud had been in these places at some time in its history. In fact, 13 of the pollens come exclusively from Palestine and are growing in Israel today. Professor Ray Zelovain found in the shroud linen microscopic bits of cotton under the microscope. And not just plain cotton, but cotton with a certain number of twists per centimeter. We have to realize that cotton has a a different number of twists per centimeter depending upon what country it's from. And cotton grown over here, for example, has 20 to 25 twists, and cotton grown over in the Middle East has 8 to 10 twists, and the cotton found in the shroud has eight, about 8 twists per centimeter, so it fits exactly the kind of cotton that's in the Middle East. And cotton, in, cotton isn't even grown commercially in Europe. Uh, they found on the shroud many highly accurate images of many flowers, uh, many hundreds of these, 28 specific flowers they found to a good degree of accuracy. That All these flowers, what's important about these flowers, they all grow in Jerusalem or within 12 miles of Jerusalem. So whatever produced the image on the shroud also produced a high energy field producing many images of every object that was in the shroud itself and hence we have a highly accurate image of these flowers. They've also found dirt on the footprint uh, of the cloth. And this dirt has been found to come from Jerusalem's Damascus Gate and nowhere else. And uh, they found three-dimensional information in the Shroud of Turin. And this is incredible because we have to realize that a painting or photograph only has two-dimensional information, height and width. And the Shroud has been found to have 3D information. And they put it under a special machine called the VP8 Analyzer. And the VP8 analyzer found that in the shroud image there is encoded three-dimensional information which an artist could not have put there. Uh, it's also a Jewish custom when people die to put coins over the eyes uh, when laying the corpse out for burial. And in the test that they did uh, examining the shroud turn, it looks like there's a coin over one of the eyes, the right eye. And this coin has 24 coincidences with a coin called the lepton, which was put out by Pontius Pilate between 29 and 36 AD. And when you look at this coin, you notice the staff. Remember the staff and the letters UKAI. And now we're going to look at the shroud, reproducing it closer and closer, larger and larger. And under high magnification, a father Phylus found this. You can see the staff and the letters UCAI. And Father Phylus was shocked to see this. And, but he wondered why there was a C instead of a K. But in 1981, at the British Museum, he found two coins that had a C instead of a K. So this information would throw forging completely out of the question. Father Phylus said, quote, Even the wildest imagination cannot now justify any claim that the tiny letters one thirty-second of an inch could have been printed on the cloth. Other features that prove the authenticity of the shroud, uh, the locks on the side of the face is a Jewish custom. The body on the shroud is not even straight. Uh, the abdomen appears swollen, uh, showing that the cause of death was suffocation. The legs on the shroud are not broken, and the Romans who crucified their victims always broke the legs of the crucified. 
And this goes back to Exodus 1246 where it says that they wouldn't break a bone in his body. Uh, the blood flows, we have to realize that when you're crucified, the hands fall to a 25-65 degree angle. And so the blood flows a certain way. And it's exactly, the blood flows on the shroud show that it was of a man who was crucified. In fact, studying the photos of the shroud caused Dr. Pierre Barberi, chief surgeon of the St. Joseph Hospital in Paris, France, to say this, quote, If this is the work of a forger, then the forger would have to be a trained anatomist, for there is not a single blunder. And uh, basically, you also have, on the shroud, you have, uh, when a nail pierces the median nerve in the wrist, the thumb goes automatically into the palm, and that's what's shown on the shroud. And this wouldn't invalidate the prophecy, they have pierced my hands and my feet, I can count on my bones, because anatomists in all countries and throughout history have understood the hand to consist of the wrist, the palm, and the fingers. And uh, this is a picture of a Roman scourging device called the flagrum. And you'll notice it consists of a handle onto which are three leather strips that are attached. And each of these leather strips have a dumbbell-shaped object attached, metal object, and this device was used by the Romans as a means of punishing an individual by, by beating his body with stripes. And if you look at the size of the dumbbell-shaped object on the end of the flagrum, it fits perfectly into the wounds on the shroud. One author wrote that there are 120 scourge wounds on the Shroud of Turin, and Jewish law limited the number of lashes to 40, and 40 times 3 is 120. The wound in the side of the shroud measures one and three-fourths inches by seven-sixteenths of an inch, which exactly corresponds to the size of the tip of the Roman spear called the Lamea. It's also called the Spear of Longinus, and it's kept in the Habsburg Treasure House in Vienna, Austria, and legend has it that this is the spear that pierced the side of Jesus, and it was owned by Longinus, a Roman soldier assigned to duty at the crucifixion site by Pontius Pilate. And uh, what's interesting is uh, that Hitler believed this legend and he visited the Habsburg treasure house when he was 19. And uh, when he invaded Austria at the very beginning of World War II, he took the spear because he believed that he had to have the spear to go out and conquer the world. Going back to the anatomy of the shroud, uh, the buttocks is rigid with rigor mortis. And some scientists have said that this uh, shroud, whoever was covered in the shroud, has been dead not more than 40 hours. Forensic pathologist from Los Angeles County, Dr. Robert Buckland, finishes his analysis of the shroud by saying, quote, The evidence of a scourge man who was crucified and died of suffocation is clear-cut. The markings on this body are so clear and so medically accurate that they are, in my opinion, beyond dispute. And the other question is, why would anyone keep this kind of relic, so gruesome a relic, unless it was the true burial cloth of Jesus Christ? But shroud advocates suffered a serious setback uh, when the carbon-14 dates came back in 1988 where it said that these, the shroud was from 1260 to 1390. And, uh, but C-14 is far from an exact science. In fact, freshly killed mollusks show that they've been dead for 3,000 years, while bristlecone pine, the oldest trees on Earth, always date too young by two to 3,000 years. And uh, evolutionist William Stansfield said this, quote, There is no absolutely reliable long-term radiological clock. And so C-14 dating is based on a number of assumptions, such as that, that the rate of decay has always been the same throughout history. The amount of C-14 in the atmosphere is the same as it always has been. It is also based on the assumption that the geologic column is correct, and we prove that that is not correct. Three labs were selected to perform the shroud carbon-14 tests. They were given three linen control samples, samples of a known age, to test the accuracy of their lab testing. One sample was known to be from 3000 BC, and when the test came back from the three labs, their uh, numbers were off by 1100 years, and uh, the tester defended these errors due to contamination of the samples, but after extensive retesting, the sample was still found to be 1100 years off. And so there are too many variables that it can affect test results, and beside the shroud sample takers and their labs violated 14 scientific protocols that were established to ensure test accuracy. And also these labs carried out their tests by consulting one another. And uh, Secretary of State Casseroli, who was rumored to be a Freemason, uh, gave supervising responsibility for the carbon-14 tests to research director of the British Museum, Dr. Michael Tithe. So it's strange that Cardinal Casseroli would give 
the supervising of the reputed burial cloth of Jesus Christ to his declared enemies. And uh, what's interesting is Dr. Tithe 